welcome to nptel noc on point set topology part 2 so today we will take module 22 stone wise truss theorems we begin with the classical result due to wise truss on approximating continuous functions defined on a closed interval by polynomial functions and then go on to study some sweeping generalization of it popularly known as stone wise truss theorems throughout this section x will denote a compact hausdorff space and later on locally compact hausdorff space that i will tell you again CXR or CXC will denote respectively Banach algebra of all real or respectively complex valued functions continuous function and we take the supremum norm because x is anyway compact the problem of approximating elements of CXR or C of XC is formulated into determining when a particular subalgebra is dense so density of certain thing just implies that you know when you take points in the closure they are the approximated functions from the set which is dense okay so that is the whole uh, terminology we begin with a classical result namely due to wise truss let f from ab to r be any continuous function then there exists a sequence of polynomials which uniformly converge to f on the interval ab see each term here is very important okay ab must be a closed interval okay and you start with a continuous function you can approximate it by polynomial functions that is the way to remember but what is exactly the meaning of approximating here that this sequence of polynomials uniformly converges to function f on the closed interval ab for simplicity of writing down the proof i will assume that the interval is 0 comma 1 but this is no loss of generality because what you can do is you can make a change of variable linear change of variable actually in the domain itself namely by taking t going to t minus a divided by b minus a when t equal to a okay this will be zero when t equal to b this b minus a or b minus a it could be one so interval ab will go to zero one okay so this way you can change the coordinates if you have a polynomial in t if you substitute t minus a divided by b minus a instead of t that will be again a polynomial in t so there is no loss of generality so from now onwards we will look at the close interval 0 1 so start with a continuous function okay defined on 0 1 so this function i am assuming this notation is again a real valued function here okay so we may assume that the second assumption f0 is 0 and f1 is also 0 so how do you do that by considering now this time i am going to change the in the domain code domain by taking gt equal to ft minus f0 minus t times the constant f1 minus f0 look at this one g of 0 is f0 minus d0 okay g of 0 is t is 0 so this is this is 0 this is f0 minus f0 is 0 g of 1 is f1 minus f0 
minus this is 1, f1 minus f0 is again 0. So this new function has this property and if I approximated f by a polynomial, approximated g by a polynomial, I can go back by this, okay. So the corresponding thing is again linear change of coordinates, okay. If you have a polynomial, the polynomial plus some lambda times uh, some constant, t times some constant is again a polynomial. So, so two such assumptions right in the beginning we are going to do, namely the domain is 0, 1 and the function is taking value 0 at both the endpoints. The advantage of this one is immediately we can extend f to the whole of R by defining it to be 0 outside of the interval 0, 1. Okay. For each positive integer n, put q n of t equal to 1 minus t square raised to n divided by alpha n okay, for all mod t less than or equal to 1. So minus 1 to plus 1, I am taking this function and I am putting 0 outside this one. Okay. So look at this one, when t equal to 1 or minus 1, this term is 0. Therefore, q and t is a continuous function on the whole of r. Okay. This alpha n is some constant here. What is that constant? It is just the integral of the numerator 1 minus t square raised to n dt minus 1 to plus 1. So, this is some kind of normalizing factor here. So, it is reflected in this property 20, namely this q and t is first of all non-negative. Okay, this is a non-negative function, this is non-negative and here it is just 0 anyway. For all t, q of minus t is q t because what appears here is t square. Okay, so q of minus t is q and t. Finally, if you integrate this q, qn from minus 1 to plus 1, okay, this alpha n is a constant that will come out, but what is the integral of the numerator? It is just alpha n itself. So, so the total integral here will be just 1. So, this is the normal, why I have made it divided by alpha n for this purpose only. The integral minus 1 to plus n qn of s ds is 1. Okay, so this is an auxiliary function which is going to help us in approximating the function with polynomials. Let us see how. Now, immediately I am going to define the sequence that we are interested in. Namely, p and t is defined to be 0 to 1 fs, f is the given function. Okay, and then qn of t minus s ds. So, what I have done is, f is a continuous function, these auxiliary functions qn which I have defined here, I am convoluting it, this is a convolution, all the way goes back to Euler. Okay, so, Weistras also has used it. Now, let, now, uh, now what I have to observe is that, this formula I will tell you that, p and t is actually a function of t first of all because the variable s is getting integrated here, it is actually a polynomial function. Why? Just look at, suppose this polynomial is a constant, then this is all the constant. If suppose there is a t term here, that t would have come out, it will be t times integral 0 to 1 fsds. If there is a t power n, the t power will com come out and then there is a function of s left out here. So, when you expand t uh, q and t, mi t minus s in terms of t and s, it will be some t power n, q power n and, and s power n and so on, but t power n will come out and then what is left out is some coefficient, right. So, p n is actually a polynomial function for each n. 
what we claim is we claim that this sequence p and t converges uniformly to f on 0 1 okay so statement is very easy statement is very clear so only thing you have to there is some q and t what was that you may not remember so you may have to remember this one in fact there are many other functions also which will do this job there is no uniqueness here okay so this is my personal choice you may say not exactly mean by many other people also used it and at this moment time i will tell you that there are many proofs of weierstrass theorem none of them go beyond the ideas of weierstrass but in computational simplicity or something else some other thing they have achieved some different things for example what i like is one proof which is there in uh, rudin's book on prin uh, principles of mathematical analysis so you can have a look at that also okay so now we have to prove that p n converges to f uniformly okay so first observation is for all t inside 0 1 we have this interval is contained inside t minus 1 comma t plus 1 right if t is within 0 1 for example the t is 0 then this is minus 1 to uh, plus 1 so it contains 0 1 and if t is 1 it will be 0 to 2 so thereof it contains so it is always this is of length how much 2 this is only if you have 1 so it always contains this one. and fs is 0 outside 0 1 okay therefore when you take the integral minus t plus 1 to t minus 1 to t plus 1 f s times something since f s is 0 outside this interval it is as if we are taking the in integration from 0 to 1 ok so that is p and t if you take 0 to 1 it is p and t so I can rewrite it as integral from t minus 1 to t plus 1 the same function I can write like this now you will see the advantage of writing like this namely substitute t minus s equal to u typical thing done when you are doing a convolution okay interchanging the variables here okay so substitute t minus s equal to u what happens to s s becomes t minus u okay and t become uh, t minus s becomes u so what happens here p and t is p and t i am substituting this one it will have a new form namely it will be minus 1 to plus 1 f of t minus u q n of u d u okay q n of t minus s like this one of course d s is minus of d u so you have to interchange the up and uh, uh, lower and upper integrals so this t minus 1 becomes 1 and t plus 1 becomes minus 1 so that is why you get plus minus 1 to plus 1 along with the sign here ds is minus du okay is that fine now what is the why i am doing all this the point is now there is symmetry the qn remember was a symmetric function so this property of qn qn is positive qn minus n equal to minus of you know qn of minus t equal to qn t in this interval okay so also the integral of minus 1 plus 1 of qn s is 1 so these properties can be used useful now okay in this form all right so you will see each of these statements will be useful now so that is all computational now but uh, it is interesting and quite uh, entertaining the simplest thing is the bernoulli inequality for modulus of t less than equal to 1 we always have 1 minus t square raised to n is bigger than 1 minus n time when you binomial expansion the first term is 1 
the first two terms are 1 minus n minus t square. You can ignore the rest of them if you put inequality like this. Okay, this is easy to prove, and there are several ways of proving this. This is just elementary calculus. And then alpha n, which is integral minus 1 to plus 1, 1 minus t square raised to n dt, is nothing but by symmetry it is 0 to 1 twice of that 1 minus t square raised to n dt the same function but that is now greater than or equal to this 2 is as it is 0 to 1 by square root of n only I am taking 1 minus n t square dt this function is smaller than this function they are all both of them positive in this in this interval provided you take only up till here there are other terms which you can ignore because you are taking only this is bigger than equal to this one but now you integrate what you get is this is bigger than equal to 4 by 3 times square root of n and that itself is bigger than 1 by square root of n so there are heavy inequalities here no no economy you may be able to prove this alpha n is bigger than equal to 1 by square root of n in many other ways. I don't care. I want one proof. So, alpha n is bigger than equal to 1 by square root of n. This is all I wanted. Okay. Next thing is for every delta between 0 and 1, we have q n of t is less than or equal to square root of n into 1 minus delta square t square. Remember what was q n t? q n t was 1 minus t square raised to n divided by alpha n. This alpha n we have estimated is bigger than 1 by square root of n. Therefore, I can ignore this alpha n now. Okay, I can uh, simplify. It becomes, it comes in the numerator here. q n t is less than equal to square root of n times 1 minus delta square okay whole square provided t itself mod t itself is bigger than or equal to delta so in this interval delta to 1 this inequality holds okay okay now recall the geometric expansion 1 by 1 minus t square square of that is nothing but 0 to infinity n plus 1 if there is a square term here that is why n plus 1 into t raised to 2 n. It is a polynomial, it is a power series in t square. So, you get t square, t to the 4 and so on. So, t raised to 2 n. This is valid for mod t less than 1. This is geometric series. Okay. This implies that if you take n plus 1 the term here, n plus r n n term here, whatever, it must tend to 0, right? Limit of n tends to infinity n plus 1 but t power 2 n is 0. Okay. Whenever mod t is less than equal to 1. This in turn implies that of course you can n to n plus 1 n plus 1 to you can restrict n also. n into t power 2 n is also 0. Okay. So sandwich theorem. Upon taking square root and putting t equal to 1 minus delta square we get limit of square root of n in 1 minus delta square raised to n is 0. So, only for this kind of purpose you have selected this function, the polynomial function. Okay. If you can choose something simpler, you will get a simpler proof of no problem. Okay. So, what I have got is that, you see, this right hand side here tends to 0 as n tends to infinity provided this is always true now if we use delta less than to t less than to then then we will we can pass on to q n here okay so let us see what is now by uniform continuity of f f is continuous and we are restricting only in the closed interval 0 1 right so therefore it is uniformly continuous given epsilon positive there will be delta 0 less than delta less than 1. I can always just choose this delta to be less than 1 such that f t minus f s modulus less than epsilon by 2 whenever 
T minus S is less than delta. Both T and S are inside R I have written. Inside zero one, of course, but because we are thinking of F as function defined on the whole of R, outside zero one we have extended it to be zero. Remember that. So this is true, whatever. Okay. Uniform continuity. First we apply for uh, closure interval zero one, but rest of them is zero. Okay, so there is no problem for that. So this is valid. Now delta has been chosen. This statement was true for any delta between zero and one. Okay, so now we will use this delta and combine all these various properties. Twenty. What is twenty? Let us just recall. Twenty. Is, I told you. These are three properties here: symmetry of Q A, non-negativity, and integral Q N C is normal. No, normalness integral minus one plus one is one. And twenty-one is the formula for P N T. Twenty-two is the is the change of formula after change of variables. Okay. Then twenty-three is Q N T is dominated by this term. Okay, which Converges to zero. Okay, that is twenty-four. So if you combine all these things, what you get is P N T minus F T modulus. We have to estimate this one, right? We have to show that this is less than epsilon. Okay. Irrespective of what T is, provided modulus of that uh, various things, whatever. Okay, so that's what we have to show. This converges. So, irrespective of what t, I must be able to choose n. So that is a uniform conversion. So, this is equal to modulus of. I am just writing down the formula for p and t, and using the fact that q n s t s integral is one, so I can multiply by f t, which is a constant, as far as the integration is concerned. So f of t minus s q n t is p n. This f t into q n s integral is just f t because integral of q n s is one. So that has been used here. So there is nothing else here. But now modulus of this one is taken in the inside the integral. Okay, modulus of the integral is less than or equal to integral of the modulus. Is the elementary property of Riemann integration functions of real valued functions? Okay, when you take the modulus inside, what you get is f of t minus s minus f s modulus q n s is non-negative, so it comes out. So is q n s d s? Okay, this less than or equal to I can put because I can't put equality here because this is only inequality. Now. This minus one to plus one, I am breaking it into three parts. One is minus one to minus delta, another one is minus delta to plus delta, and the last one is delta to one of the same function. So write down these three things. Now in the first interval, minus one to minus delta. Okay, what is happening? This will be less than or equal to m. F t is less than equal to m has been chosen. So this is a general bound. So I am using that. So F t minus s minus F s. There are two terms. Modulus of this difference is less than equal to modulus of this plus modulus of that. Both of them are less than equal to that two m. Then integral of q s d s as it is. I don't know what it is. First I have got this much. In the second term. I am putting f of t. This one is less than f sine by two. Okay, between minus delta to plus delta. So this is where I have used this one now. So this f s f of t minus s minus f of t. This is less than or equal to epsilon by two. So that goes away. Q n of d s remains. The third the third part again. I am estimating this part. It's two m times zero to one Q n of s d s. Okay, so different estimates in three different. This part and this part is same similar estimates. 
now what happens this is same thing as 4m times square root of n into 1 minus delta square ds so this is where i have used the qn is dominated by this term okay this term is also dominated by that and minus 1 to delta and delta to 1 these two intervals are integrals are the same <laughs> okay so i can bring them together so 4m times this one this is where minus of qs q, q of sorry qn of minus s is q qn of s is just okay symmetry is just okay so this term is big is smaller than integral of minus 1 to plus 1 minus 1 to plus 1 is 1 so this is also less than equal to 1 so it is just epsilon right so what we have shown is p n t minus f n t is less than equal to this one this square root of n has come here if you choose n sufficiently large okay this can be made less than epsilon right so epsilon right 2 plus epsilon right 2 is less than epsilon so no no t is in order here for all t n is sufficiently large what sufficiently large that will depend upon uh, your epsilon only because this term goes to 0 as n goes to 0 so this proves Weierstrass theorem okay let us uh, take a one small step before uh, closing up today towards uh, more general results now for generalizations the only thing that we use from above classical result is the following corollary which can be proved in different ways you don't have to prove the full theorem Weierstrass theorem okay so what is the corollary corollary is one let a be a closed subalgebra of cxr okay remember subalgebra etc we have we have defined in the in part one close means this there is a topology here closeness with respect to topology this is algebra so it's a closed subalgebra of cxr if f is inside a then f modulus of f is inside a so this is what we want to prove okay why here is the proof so this is directly by uh, weierstrass approximation given epsilon positive choose a polynomial p1 and p1 a polynomial means uh, real coefficients everything right so far p1 is an rt such that mod t is approximated by p1 namely norm of mod t minus p1 is less than epsilon by 2 on the entire interval this time interval is minus 1 to plus 1 i am taking because mod t i am going to use remember uh, the weierstrass theorem was proved for all intervals all closed intervals okay there is a polynomial let that polynomial look like a naught plus a one t plus a n t power n okay put p t equal to p one t minus a naught if this uh, this constant term is a disturbing me so i will throw away and let's look at the rest of the terms p t is p one t minus a naught then modulus of a naught is less than equal to epsilon by 2 why because you put t equal to 0 here this is just modulus of a naught is less than epsilon by 2 and mod t minus p now is epsilon by 2 this a naught is missing that will be less than epsilon now epsilon plus epsilon by 2 plus epsilon by 2 so it is epsilon okay norm of this is less than epsilon that is why i had chosen here epsilon by 2 so now what I have got is a function p, polynomial p, without a constant term, just like t, right? Mod t is approximated by this function. Now, given any a belong, any f belonging to a, any element of a, first of all, we may assume that f is not zero. Okay. So what we want to prove is that mod f it belongs to a right 
But if f is zero function, mod f is also zero function. There is no nothing to um, prove. Algebras have always zeros anyway. Sub algebras they are. So we may assume f is not zero identically, so that its norm is also not zero. Now you divide by the norm. Take g equal to f by norm f. Okay. Now look at g is also continuous function from minus one to plus one. Okay. Earlier it could be any polynomial function with now minus one plus one. It's a continuous function. Okay. Is inside A. Okay. Why? Because I have just divided it by. This is just a scalar function. Okay. So polynomial. This algebra sub algebra are vector spaces after all. Since A is an algebra, it follows that even if I take some constant, you know, a one times this one, a two times this one square, and so on, and then add them up. Okay, each term will be inside A. Some some will be also inside A. So any for any polynomial is true. In particular, if you put P G, see the constant term is missing here. That is important. I have no control of constant. A one times G is there because G is there. A two times G square is there. So something some total is there. So P G itself is there. Okay. Moreover, now look at mod G minus. P G norm of this one. See, remember the polynomial, the, all these Weierstrass theorem was only for continuous functions defined on a closed interval. Now we have gone into arbitrary space, okay? But now the image is minus one plus one, so everything is happening in the image. So mod G, where is it taking values? Minus one plus one. So it is like G is a variable T. That is precisely what I am thinking. G is like a variable t, t equal to g x. Okay, so that is the function. The mod g minus mod p g minus p g, the norm of that. Okay, this is same thing as supremum of all x belonging to x such that modulus of g x minus modulus of p g x. Take the difference, take the modulus, and take the suprema. Right, that is the definition of the sup norm. But this supremum norm is less than or equal to t varying between minus one plus one. Bo, oh, this 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 value is between minus one plus one. Whenever g x is inside x, g x is inside minus one plus one. Okay, so I take t between minus one plus one. Okay, modulus of t minus p t. You take the supremum of all these elements. So this may be larger because all t inside zero one may not be attained. So this is a larger set. The supremum of a larger set is larger at the most. So this is less than this is less than equal to this one. Okay. So that is equal to. But what is this one? This is the same thing as norm of mod t minus p. See, I am I am not. If you don't like this symbol, you should write. You know something like uh, lambda is my lambda of t equal to mod t. So that function lambda minus p norm, which is less than epsilon. Okay, so mod g minus mod p is less than epsilon. That is what we have got. Okay, so this just means that given every epsilon, there is a g like this. That p g is an element of A, which just means that this mod g is in the closure of A. But closure of A is A itself because we have assumed that A is closed. Okay, therefore, mod f, which is multiple of norm, if you multiply by this scalar, that will be also inside. Once mod g is inside A, norm f times mod g will be also inside A, but that is mod f. Okay. The next we consider. An elementary algebraic result, namely, instead of studying the big algebra C X R, we just study the algebra R cross R. Think of R as a ring. R cross R is a ring structure, right? So, what is that ring structure? I am telling you, is A one B one, 
into a to b2 is just coordinate wise multiplicity a one a to b one b2 okay so this is not like you know it's not like complex number there is a complicated multiplication is there so this is the the algebra which is a product of r and r okay look at this algebra any closed sub algebra of r2 has to be one of the following 1 2 3 4 5 it can be zero okay it can be zero cross r it can be r cross zero it can be the diagonal delta r or it can be the whole of r2 so these are the only possibilities of sub algebras why of course zero is there of course r2 is there and these these are sub algebras that's very easy to verify right but why are they are the only ones that's easy because a sub algebra is first of all a vector subspace vector subspace of two dimensional vector vector space right r cross r is two dimensional vector space over r has to be either zero dimensional one dimensional or two dimensional zero and two are taken care one and this five one two three this two three four these correspond to one dimensional subspaces how do you show that a one dimensional space is spanned by some vector right some some vector if that vector is of this form 0 comma some r then it will be this one if it is of this form it is this one but other one is i want to say it is it is actually delta x itself why this is true so this is one thing which bothers us right So you have to do a little more algebra than vector spaces. Okay, otherwise you are classifying all vector spaces. All vector, spaces, all the lines are there. Other lines don't come here at all. Is what you have to see, right? Okay. So we will see that. That will be the end of it. So take A B belonging to A, which is non-zero element of this subalgebra. So I am looking at this one-dimensional case, but it's subalgebra. Therefore. A B square must be also inside the, but A B square is by definition A square comma B square. A B A B is A square B square, right? This must be also inside this so one-dimensional space, so it must be a multiple of A B. That lambda is some real number. So A square B square is lambda times A B for some lambda inside R. The case when a is zero or b is zero correspond to zero cross r or r cross zero. So let us forget about that. The other case is when a and b are non-zero. A square equal to lambda a and a is non-zero implies a is equal to lambda. Similarly, b square equal to lambda b implies lambda equal to b. So we have got a equal to lambda equal to b. So therefore. This is some A A. That just means that this curly A is nothing but a diagonal, the positive diagonal A A. So that is the theorem. That is the lemma here. So there are only five subalgebras. We will see that the entire uh, thing will be reduced to uh, this two-dimensional case. Okay. that mean and the proof of stone wise stress theorem that we are going to study all right so that we will do next time thank you